Hey guys, in this video, we're going to be talking about protein structure, specifically uh, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. We'll talk about alpha helices and beta sheets, and we'll talk about the difference between fibrous and globular proteins. And last, we'll talk about the denaturation of proteins. And by the end of the video, you should be able to identify the different levels of protein folding. So let's talk about secondary structure. Secondary structure is a discrete 3D arrangement uh, within the protein itself. And this happens from hydrogen bonding between the amide backbone of the protein. And there are two ways this can occur. It can occur as a coil known as an alpha helix or it can occur as a beta pleated sheet. And so we'll talk about each of these. So in an alpha helix, your peptide coils. And as it coils, you end up with these carbonyl C double bond O's pointed at your NHs. And so the NH is a hydrogen bond donor. The carbonyl is a hydrogen bond acceptor, and so you get a hydrogen bond between those amides. And then you move up one more amino acid, and you get another hydrogen bond along the amide. Next amino acid, another one. And so you get this repeating pattern of hydrogen bonding occurring all along the coil. And the longer you coil, the more hydrogen bonds there are. So it's a really, really stable structure. It just naturally occurs in some proteins. They just start coiling up like a phone cord. Um, and so it's caused by the hydrogen bonds along the amide backbone. Now, beta sheets are also caused by hydrogen bonding along the backbone. But instead of coiling, what happens is one sheet runs this way and then it makes a turn and then like the strand runs backwards along itself and you get hydrogen bonding all along the two strands as they run next to each other. And so you can see here's like the N terminus and the C terminus. So your peptide chain runs this way and then it'll coil and then run back parallel to itself and then turn and run parallel again. And you get the NH pointed at the C double bond O, hydrogen bond. Next amino acid down, carbonyl, NH, hydrogen bond. Next amino acid, carbonyl, NH, hydrogen bond. So it's kind of like a ladder where you just get hydrogen bonds like rungs just repeating all down the chain. So it's really stable. It's a lot of hydrogen bonding. Um, these are semi-rigid structures. They just, they hydrogen bond to each other and they get really stiff and they stay in that conformation. It's uh, very stable. So alpha helices and beta sheets or beta pleated sheets. I call them pleated because it's like a pleated skirt. It goes up and down, up and down, like a metal roof kind of. Uh, but most people just call it a beta sheet, not a beta pleated sheet. So those are the two types of secondary structures. Now, it's not to say every protein has these. Some proteins have one of these. Some proteins have both of these in different regions. Some proteins don't have either of these structures. It's just a structure that can occur and is very common. Now, it gets tedious to draw this out like that. And so we use shorthand symbols to imply an alpha helix or a beta sheet, or just a random region of the protein that is neither an alpha helix or a beta sheet. And these are used within what's called a ribbon diagram to draw proteins. And so here are two different molecular representations or ways to draw the protein. We can have the ball and stick model, which by the time you get to a protein that's hundreds of amino acids, this is overwhelming to look at. Like nobody can look at this and get useful information out of it because it's just too busy. And so what we do is we use these ribbon diagrams, which are 
much, much more simplified, um, but they can still give you uh, good information. And so as you can see, there are regions showing alpha helices, these green coils are all your alpha helix regions. And then you've got these arrows, these flat arrows over here. And those are showing regions with beta sheets where the strands are running parallel to each other and hydrogen bonding. And then all these loops in plain white are just regions of the protein that don't have any secondary structure. They're flexible regions, if you will. So ribbon diagrams are typically how biochemists look at proteins uh, once you get past a certain point, because it's just so much easier to look at. Now, this leads me to my next point. <laughs> this protein here has a very specific 3D shape. You know, if you're looking right here, it's got an alpha helix, or if you're looking right here, it's got a beta sheet. But if you look at the entire protein, it has its own unique overall 3D shape. That's what we call the tertiary structure. Tertiary structure is that total three-dimensional shape of a protein. And there are a number of different forces that are responsible for that. So we have the intermolecular forces back from chapter seven that we learned about, dispersion forces between two nonpolar things, hydrogen bonds between very electronegative atoms. And then you can also have ionic bonding. If you have an NH3 plus and an O minus, those are oppositely charged. So they form an ionic bond. And we can also have disulfide bonds, which uh, are somewhat uh, familiar. We learned about those in chapter 14, I think, 12. So here's a cartoon showing a made up protein chain coiling. And then they're showing the types of interactions that would be responsible for that coiling. And so they're trying to give examples of these four types of forces. And so if you look, you've got your N terminus and your C terminus, and in between stuff's happening. So right here, you've got the strand going down, making a turn and then running parallel to itself. And you have hydrogen bonds going across. This is an example of a beta sheet, right? Where you go, you make a turn and you run parallel to yourself with all those hydrogen bonds. That's a beta sheet, right? But you can also have hydrogen bonds that aren't part of a beta sheet. So let's say you make this turn and then you randomly have, you know, a C double bond O and an NH over here. And they are going to hydrogen bond and cause this extra loop here because they're pinching it off. Or let's say you have two nonpolar amino acids. You know, you've got a leucine and a valine. They're both hydrocarbons, and so they have dispersion forces between them that makes them stick together, right? Or you could have ionic attractions. You can have an ammonium, like on a lysine, and you can have a carboxylate, negatively charged, like on a glutamate. And those opposite charges form an electrical attraction known as an ionic bond. So you can have an ionic bond making it fold together more hydrogen bonding, or you can have a disulfide bond where two thiols cross-linked to make that disulfide, which is technically a covalent bond. Um, and then here on the right side, they're showing you an alpha helix again, where the strand coils and hydrogen bonds to itself. Okay. So this simple cartoon was just to illustrate how you can have all different types of intermolecular forces between the different side chains of the amino acids. And that leads to the protein forming its total 3D shape. Now, let's take a closer look at disulfide bonds. Cysteine is the only amino acid whose side chain has a thiol. Now, we learned this reaction of thiols right several chapters ago 
If you have two thiols, they can get oxidized. The hydrogens get removed and the two sulfurs connect directly together. This is known as a disulfide bond or a disulfide bridge. It can happen with any two thiols, but in proteins, cysteine is the only amino acid that has a SH side chain. And so we only see this happening with cysteines. And there are two ways this can occur. You can have a disulfide bond between two cysteines on the same protein chain. So if you have a protein chain with a cysteine and a cysteine, it can fold around and form a disulfide to itself, which makes it into a loop. Or you can have two different protein chains, each with a cysteine, and you can make a disulfide and cause two separate proteins to connect together. So you can make a loop within one protein, or you can connect two separate proteins together using disulfides. And as an example, let's take a look at human insulin. So insulin is actually a protein. It's a uh, signaling hormone. And this is the cartoon structure of it. And the S's stand for sulfur on these cysteine residues. And you'll see that there's actually two separate protein chains cross-linked by, di by disulfide bonds. So those disulfides are what are holding the two chains together. But this blue chain A here has its own disulfide holding it into a loop. So uh, insulin actually has both examples, right? You've got the intramolecular disulfide where it's bonding to itself. And then you have the inter uh, molecular disulfides where two different molecules are being connected. So now that we've talked about the different forces responsible for tertiary folding, let's talk about quaternary structure. So quaternary structure occurs when two or more separate proteins come together. So insulin actually has quaternary structure because it's two different protein chains stuck together. So technically it has some quaternary structure there. Um, but there are a wide variety of proteins that have quaternary structure. They're usually really big and they're made from multiple protein subunits like coming together and aggregating to form this bigger complex. Not all proteins have quaternary structure, just some do. So to recap these levels of protein structure, I have this chart. So primary structure is the first level of protein folding, and that's what amino acids are there from N to C. What's the sequence of amino acids? That's primary structure. Secondary structure, could be either alpha helices or beta sheets. Most proteins have one or the other or both. Some proteins don't have either. It's just a shape that proteins can have, a secondary structure. Tertiary structure is the total 3D shape. So all proteins have a tertiary structure, right? Everything has a shape to it, whether or not it's unique. <laughs> um, so the tertiary structure is just the overall 3D shape. And what dictates tertiary structure? All those different intermolecular forces. And then quaternary structure is if you have multiple proteins aggregating together to make a complex. That's quaternary structure. So you got to know those four levels of protein structure and what each one is, right? Like sequence of amino acids, alpha helix or beta sheet, total 3D shape, and you got to know the forces responsible. So here's a little chart summarizing it, but basically everything we just mentioned.
So primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Now let's talk about protein denaturation. Denaturation, can we break that word down? So naturation means like the natural shape of a protein. So when a protein's folded, that's its natural state. It's in the shape that it was designed to be in. Denaturation means to undo the natural shape. So basically you're unfolding the protein. So in order to unfold the protein, we have to disrupt all of these molecular forces that are holding it into that 3D shape. And so how do you disrupt intermolecular forces or even bonds in the case of a disulfide? Well, there are several ways that you can break up those intermolecular forces. First one is using heat. And so everyone's familiar with this, right? You take a cracked raw egg, it's clear, you can see through it. You put it in the pan, after a minute, it's solid white. You can't see through it anymore. Something happened to the egg. What happened? The proteins that were dissolved got denatured from the heat and they're no longer soluble and they precipitate out as solids and that's what makes it look white instead of clear. So uh, heat or organic compounds. These can break apart hydrogen bonding. They can disrupt hydrophobic interactions. Um, yeah. The second way is with acids and bases. Uh, you're probably familiar with this if you've ever had ceviche, right? So ceviche is like raw fish, but you coat it in lime juice and the lime cooks the fish. Well, it's not actually cooking it, but there is some truth. The acids from the lime juice change the pH enough to where the protein in the fish starts unfolding and folding differently because you're disrupting all of those hydrogen bonds and all those ionic attractions. And so by adding acid, you're denaturing the proteins in the raw fish. So you're not cooking it with heat, but you are chemically altering the protein structure using acids and bases. You can do this using heavy metal ions. So disulfide bonds are particularly susceptible to heavy metals. Sulfur loves to bond with heavy metals. And so in the presence of a heavy metal, disulfide bonds will break and grab a hold of the metal ion instead. Um, they take advantage of this uh, in cooking, in French cuisine. They use copper pans to make certain dishes involving eggs. And there's some truth to it. So like if you're trying to make like a lemon meringue and you want to whip up the, the egg white, a lot of times they'll do it in a copper pan. And the copper ions will actually break the disulfide bonds within the egg protein which allows it to whip up easier. Um, I don't know how they discovered that, you know, like 100, 200 years ago before we knew these structures, but I guess trial and error, but there is some truth to the chemistry behind it. So heavy metals will chop disulfide bonds. Um, disulfide bonds are actually what's responsible for curly hair. So if you have naturally curly hair, it's because your hair proteins have disulfides that make it coil on itself. The hair bends and then it gets a disulfide and then it bends and then a disulfide and so it keeps it in a curl. Um, when you use a straightener, you're using heat to actually break those disulfide bonds. But they can reform eventually. So like you could straighten your hair with a straightening iron, but then you take a shower later and it gets wet and then those sulfurs come into contact again and then they reform the disulfide. So it's like a back and forth battle.
Um, same thing with chemical perms. Uh, you can chemically treat your hair to break those disulfides. So, anyway, uh, the last way to denature a protein is agitation. So uh, like we were saying with the lemon meringue, right? Like you beat the egg whites enough, they get fluffy and frothy uh, and stiff. And that's because you're denaturing the protein, but through physical agitation. So four ways to denature a protein. And we have this lovely image of an egg being cooked to illustrate <laughs> the denaturation. And so a raw egg is clear. And that's because you have proteins that are spherical-ish and they're dissolved in the liquid part here. They're totally dissolved in water inside the egg. But when you cook the egg, you boil off the water and the folded protein in its natural form gets misfolded or unfolded from the temperature and that's now a denatured protein. The spherical one dissolved. The denatured one does not. And so that's why it goes from clear to opaque white is because it's no longer dissolved in liquid. It's precipitating out like a solid. And this just cakes up as the, the white egg. Still nutritionally the same. Um, but if this protein was needed for like the chicken to hatch, obviously it can't hatch anymore. You know, like the protein it needed is denatured. <laughs> so uh, inside your body, you don't want proteins to denature. That's bad. Uh, but in your food, you don't care. So flow chart showing everything we just talked about. You can denature proteins using heat, acids and bases, organic compounds, heavy metals, or by physical agitation. All right, last couple slides. Let's talk about fibrous versus globular proteins. So we can typically classify proteins based on their 3D shape. Um, shape determines function. So the tertiary or quaternary structure of a protein completely dictates what function that protein has. And two of the biggest subcategories are fibrous and globular proteins. So fibrous proteins, as the name implies, are like fibers, like rope made from protein. They don't dissolve in water usually. They're too big. Globular proteins are these like spherical proteins that totally dissolve in water. They dissolve in your blood. And these usually serve as transport molecules or signaling molecules, um, things that need to travel throughout your body. Fibrous proteins tend to be made in one area of the body and they just stay there forever. And we will look at some examples of each of these. So the first type of fibrous protein we'll look at is alpha keratin. This is the main component of wool and certain other uh, hair and nails. And so alpha keratin is basically an alpha helix. But then two of these alpha helices get coiled together. And then those two alpha helices get coiled with another two and then they get coiled with another two. And the next thing you know, you're basically just making a rope out of all these alpha helix coils. And a single strand of hair, as you can see, is like hundreds or thousands of coils of alpha helices here. Um, and so they coil on each other and then they coil further and then they get coiled further and eventually you know, you've got hundreds or thousands of these individual alpha helices, and it makes this long, rigid fiber. So, um, yeah, fibrous protein, alpha keratin, basically just coils of coils of coils 
uh, very stiff and rigid. That's why you can cut, you know, the wool off a sheep and make clothing out of it that'll last for years. It's a very strong, stable molecule. It's just braided on top of itself. This is kind of the same process we use to make like climbing ropes, right? It's just coil on coil on coil. Collagen is similar, but a little different. So collagen forms a triple helix. And it's one of the only proteins that the coils run the opposite direction. So normal alpha helices go, I think it's um, counterclockwise, but the collagen runs clockwise um, as it coils, which is weird. And it's three of them braided together instead of two at a time. So it's, it's just a unique protein and how it coils. So here's the structure uh, or the repeating structure of collagen. So collagen is, it's not that many different amino acids, but then this sequence of like 10 to 20, like repeats over and over and over again. Uh, and then you take those triple helices and then you, you know, make a bundle of many of those. And that's a collagen fiber. Collagen is used in your skin. It's what gives your skin its elasticity and rigidity. That's why you can pull on your skin and it doesn't just tear, right? Like my skin is attached to my face by collagen, which at the molecular level are these, you know, super sturdy ropes. Um, another interesting thing with collagen is vitamin C gets, um, like intercalated into these fibers as they're being created. And it regulates the consistency of the fibers as they're being laid down. So like as your body is uh, building collagen either for skin or connective tissue, um, your cells want to lay these collagen fibers down in a nice orientation. And the vitamin C regulates the um, deposition of the collagen fibers in the right orientation. And so if you don't get enough vitamin C, your body actually doesn't make healthy collagen. Um, so it can start affecting like your skin and your connective tissues and your joints if you don't get enough vitamin C. That was a more recent discovery. I think it was like in the last 10 to 15 years, they realized that vitamin C was like crucial for collagen synthesis. All right, so now that we've talked about a couple fibrous proteins, let's look at some globular proteins. So myoglobin is a 153 amino acid globular little protein. It transports oxygen in muscle tissues. Uh, it has this special molecule called a heme, which is shown here. It's an organic molecule that surrounds an iron atom in the center. And in the presence of oxygen gas, oxygen gas will fit in this little pocket here and connect to the iron and be really attracted to it. And that's how your body stores the oxygen and transports it because it's the oxygen is embedded within the protein stuck to the heme iron, like a little magnet. Now, similar to myoglobin, but a little bigger and flashier, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has quaternary structure. It's four subunits, each with their own heme group. Uh, and so one hemoglobin can carry four oxygen atoms, whereas a myoglobin can only carry one oxygen atom per protein. And that's it for my examples, I guess. So you don't need to know the details of these proteins or their structure or anything like that. I'm just showing you examples of globular proteins. You can see how it's mostly spherical, spherical. It's designed to dissolve in water. Unlike the fibrous proteins, which are super, super long, these get turned into hair and nails and like horns <laughs> on other animals. Um, 
So they're really tough and rigid, uh, but they don't dissolve in water. Okay. Same thing with alpha keratins. Long, long, super durable fibers, but it's more of a fiber than it is a, a small soluble protein. Talk about denaturation of proteins, right? You can heat them or use acids or base or organic compounds and you can make the proteins misfold, which we call denaturation. And there were four levels of protein structure. Primary is sequence of amino acids. Secondary is alpha helix or beta sheet. Tertiary is that overall 3D structure and quaternary is if you have multiple proteins coming together. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.